Behind all the glamour. Behind the Lux listings. A raw take on all things real estate. All things New York City. All, all things, things us. Welcome back, everyone. This is episode number five of our podcast. I'm Tim Malone. And Steve Cohen. And today we are going to talk about being gay, coming out, gay marriage. Um, here we go. <laughs> being gay, meaning we're just happy and jovial sure. all the time, right? And how it t ties into real estate. real estate in New York City. <laughs> all right. So, you know, we we talk about and think about different topics, and some of them are very timely. Um, we're always gay, so I guess it's timely all days. But we just thought we'd talk about, we. Tim and I were having a conversation the other day, and it, it struck us, A, our, our coming out stories, and but mostly where we grew up, how we grew up, our difference in age and generation, and therefore the different experiences people have. And God willing, in some ways, how far we've come, right? So, uh, gay marriage, legal since... 2015. 2015. And Do you obviously, remember? Do I remember when... Yeah, when it was announced, what happened? Sure. Like the White um, House lit up and... Yeah, of course I remember. I mean, and I think, you know, now in 2022, seven years later, you know, in the political landscape that we're in and where, you know, the Supreme Court's decisions, I think... What's today? Thursday. Two two days ago, the Senate just voted to codify legal marriage mm -hmm. for um, for everyone, which I think is a huge step just to you know protect the right. You know, but I think being in New York City, I think it's easy to you know our experiences oh, so, are individual, yeah. and I think your your experience is different than my experience, yeah. but our experiences are different from you know someone even a hundred miles away from here, let alone in the middle of the country, the middle of the country yeah. or somewhere else in the world. You know, it's funny. Um, you say New York city, there's a famous line in a movie. Do you remember the movie, uh, boiler room? Yeah. With the, uh, yeah. uh, Ben Affleck and uh, Casey Affleck. And there are two gay couples or four gay guys are in a restaurant in New York city. And these kind of bros, if you will, from not New York city, basically say to the the gay couple or the gay the gay table you know they should uh, create an island and put all of you people on it and the gay couple being witty and biting as we all are responded back they have and you're on that island meaning manhattan so totally. yeah our experience here growing up i know that when i moved back from south africa and i was looking at different places where i wanted to live Judaism and having a really strong Jewish community was important to me, obviously business, but also a gay community. And New York seemed to have the most of that. Totally. And I think it's easy to live in this, you know, in Manhattan, in New York City, move in these circles that we move in, in an industry that thankfully is, for the most part, really accepting and mm -hmm. open-minded. Um, obviously, we run into situations, and I think that's what we'll talk about. But I don't I feel like as we talk about this, it's super key to also remember that our experiences are probably not the norm. Of and you know, right. or, you or look at like, well, they're the norm for us. They may not be the norm sure, for others. Sure. But you know, I was listening to the the World Cup and in Qatar, it's not legal to be you can't even like have a gay act. You mm -hmm. can't even hold hands. You couldn't right. even, yeah. you know, and people are being arrested and harmed for who they love and worse. Yeah. You know? And so that's a challenging part of this conversation because yeah, the New York city real estate has, you know, we've been lucky. I think, I think the community here is accepting, um, you know, there's little nuances, but, um, I just think it's, it's important to realize there's other yeah. stories. Everyone in the world. has, uh, yeah. there are different experiences and funny, just personal growth. And I can say for myself, a few years ago, I don't think I would have been comfortable. Not that, you know, <laughs> I have kids, I have a partner, I'm not hiding anything. I don't know that I would have been so comfortable 10, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, just doing a whole podcast on this. Right. But I guess the older, the wiser, the less you care, um, or the but more again, comfortable that, we become with ourselves. I think it's, I personally believe it's regionally. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we're in a, we're in a place, we're in a, our our friends, our family, like we're in a place where we have that, thank God, that support. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I don't know if you talk to real estate agents in other parts of the country, right. would they do this podcast? You know? Just, yeah, so. that's right. Um, all right. So let's jump in. Yep. So tell me, I'll ask you first, uh, do you have a coming out story? <laughs> so I always think everyone has these like stories. I don't have a story. I think, I mean, I have a story. It's my story. I get it. Um, but I remember talking to my, my parents and in the back of my head, I knew it wasn't really going to be a, well, first of all, how old were you? I was 26 and it wasn't going to be a groundbreaking, like monumental, you know, you, you weren't scared. I wasn't scared at all. Um, it was you know, another conversation. It was another conversation. Life moved on. Life just progressed. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions so we can yeah. kind of get the picture and set the the scene. So. You said 26? 26, Okay, yeah. and this was visiting your parents in their home, the home you grew yep. up in, yep. uh, out east. And okay. did you date men and women growing up, boys and girls? You yeah, know? yeah, of yeah. course. I mean, I dated dated both guys and girls. and But not openly. At what um, point were you openly? No, I was, yeah. Even in high school? No. Not in high school, no. Yeah, no. so you were dating girls. You were just, yeah. had your friends, yeah. dated girls. Yep. Um, when did you? I think I just got yeah. to a point in my life where I was like, rip the bandaid off. I was right. like, this is this is who I am. I had every confidence that I was going to have the support, and that's where I'm super lucky and super blessed. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, because I had that foundation, and there wasn't a doubt in my mind. So for me, I almost hate talking about myself because I hate saying like it was easy, but okay. it wasn't something. It was your experience. Yeah, it wasn't something that you know I. And that's why I'm very like cognizant to be careful mm -hmm. and always remember that my story is not the norm. Or not everyone's story. But it's Could not be everyone's the norm story for yeah. others. Yeah. So did you always know who you were attracted to? I didn't to? always know. It wasn't always something that I thought about, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Okay. Um, it wasn't that I was blocking it out. It wasn't that I was not of, you know, acknowledging. I just don't think it was something I thought about. Do you remember something where it actually hit you? You met someone or you? Monumentally, no. I mean, I'm sure there were like cases here and there mm -hmm. and like, in, but nothing like that stands out like, oh, that's the day the flag, right. like <laughs> I raised the flag. Like, no. Do you think, um, all right, so you sit down with your parents. Did you call a meeting or it was casual? It was like, just like, yeah, look, I, I mean, we were talking and then I just kind of told them and, and it's exactly say? what I thought it was going to be. Like, and they said, okay. Yeah. Do you think they knew? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think they knew and I don't think they cared. Not in the sense that they didn't care. I just don't think it was like something that they weren't going to. Okay. So I knew yeah. in life I had their support. Yeah. There is nothing I could do that they wouldn't be my biggest defense. Okay. So question, growing up, I imagine in your home, I know your parents, that there was never any... Uh, harsh words, condescending words around being gay. There were gay people in your life. So it was just like, of course, this will be accepted. Um, that's, I mean, if I think back, that's not necessarily a hundred percent true. Cause I can think of times where there were situations, but I think in the late eighties, we mm -hmm. all talk differently, mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. that's right yeah. or wrong. Well, but I we, can, my friends and I, we call it eighth grade gay because in eighth grade, you called everyone gay. You didn't mean right. homosexual. You just, meant, and I oh, just that's think, so gay. I think society was way more just not aware like we are in 2022. Sure. Yep. Um, you know, and that's something that to tie in this real estate, which we are real estate agents, like you can't say Jack and Jill like a bathroom. Oh. I find it fascinating. Right. You know? And in 1990, nobody would have like questioned. They still, I mean, there's a lot of people that still stay like, it's a Jack and Jill bathroom. Right. And in my head, every time I'm on a showing, I'm like, you can't say it. Explain why. You because... can't say Jack and Jill because it might be Jack and Jack. Right. Or it might be Jill and Jill. Right. And, Which is, you know, okay. I'm not going to like raise the red card and say, guys, you can't call that. But right. in 1990, that was never even a discussion. Yes. So with my parents, if I think back, were there, yeah, there were, of course there were comments in our house. Not of course, but there were. Right. Were they like awful? No, but I just think it becomes awareness. And I think we've all grown in the last 30 years. And now it's just, you know, I mean, 
Don's, a, you know, my partner's a huge part of my life, my family's life, my nephews, my nieces. Like, there's no, it's just, it's just a part of my story and a thread of, you know, the fabric of my life. Like, I don't see it as like, it's not a, I don't know how to say it. It's just right. not a. So there you have it. That's our podcast. Yeah. Tim has no story. Uh, no, I have a story. I'm I just don't. kidding. Yeah. It's your story. Yeah. Mine's a little different. I'm older. I was born in 1967. And it, it definitely, uh, talking about eighth grade gay, what was accepted, living, quote, in the closet. I've known since I've been, I, I say this, I've known since I've been three years old. And I remember knowing and laying in bed and thinking at a very young age, maybe not three, that somehow I, I knew in my gut and uh, instinctively that I will have a number of years that I have to live with this hiding this and that at a certain point I'll have to merge the outside world and who I truly am with who I truly am on the inside, inside and outside. So it's amazing at a young age that I knew that, but I did. And I think on and off my parents knew they say, you know, a mother always knows, but then, and Kirk says, I always talk about this, but here we go. Um, you know, I dated a lot of women in high school and college. I had a lot of girlfriends. I had hair and I was very cute. And I also remember thinking that the more notches I have on my belt, meaning the more women people know that I've dated or have been with, that the longer I will have to actual, actually reconcile and have to come out. So I, I was also very conscious about that. So I came out. I lived in Washington, D.C. for three years after college, and I lived with three of my best friends, uh, Kenny Holdsman, Rob Getzoff, and Mike Bloom, and then John Wilk moved in. But we, this, I, I was dating someone very seriously, a, a woman, and then I was getting more in touch with, I've always, again, I always knew I had these feelings. I was secretly or quietly acting upon them you know, outside of my, what anyone knew. But then in 1990, yeah, 1990, I knew that kind of it was time to, I, I couldn't live, keep living a lie. I remember my father said to me, living a lie is one of the hardest and most undignified ways to live. And that really stayed with me. So do you think he knew? Maybe on a, yeah, I think he probably thought about it sometimes. Is that why he said that? No, I think he was just saying that statement. Saying Jim. that statement. I don't think it was. It was when I was much younger. We were talking about. I don't even remember what we were talking about. No, I don't think it was directed to that. Got it. And that's a good question, though. Um, so I'm in D.C. and I have all my friends, and you know, it's after college, and we're working, having fun, and doing all that, and. I started, I was very conscious that I was going to come out to my friends and family, my friends and family, but my friends are a huge support and big part of my life. To this day, all those people I mentioned, Kenny, Wilk, I saw last week, Bloom, you know, they're all in my life. They've been in my life. Kenny, I've known since sixth grade is son's my godson. I introduced him to his wife, Amy, 27 or 30 years ago. So like I hold on to these friendships and they're really important uh, and they're my family, part of my family. But anyway, I was very conscious that if I was going to come out, my fear was that I would be rejected by all my friends, this great support network I had. So I consciously found my gay friends and my gay community in Washington, D.C., who to this day are still all very close friends wanted to establish this friendship, this group and this community I had around me just in case I was completely rejected. Anyway, so that's how I came out to my friends. And the kind of the, the culmination of all this is when I left DC in 92, my friend Greg Brennan had this big party. He owned a townhouse. And I remember standing, uh, and the theme of the party was my bar mitzvah and Scott Jaffa, also a, still a close friend and client, he dressed up in drag and he, it was, the theme was my bar mitzvah. So he was my mother. So he played my mother and all these people were there. But the point is I was looking over this landing, looking over Greg's like huge living room and 
all my straight friends were there, all my gay friends. And we had all then at that point just merged as just friends. And I remember thinking, wow, all my fears were, you know, not, they just, they weren't necessary. They, they, they were just fears mm -hmm. and that I was ready to leave DC. I've achieved what I needed to achieve and move to my, go on to the next chapter of my life. So that's how that all happened. It was a little different with my family. We're going to hear about that. Um, God, after that long winded story, you really want to hear more. Yeah. Um, my mother came to visit me in DC for a weekend and I, everyone was away that weekend. So I had written her a five page letter coming out to her essentially. And in it, I put my mother who's, you know, Barbara still living and knows all these people. And she was disowned by her mother when she was 18 or 19. She married her first husband who wasn't Jewish. And my grandmother disowned her because she married a non-Jew. We're going back, you know, we're talking different generations. My grandmother came around when my brother Mark was born, when my mother gave birth at whatever it was, 19 or 20, and she came around, and so they reconciled. But in the letter I wrote, please don't make the same mistake that your mother made. Meaning, like, I was really scared my mother was going to possibly shun me or disown was a, was a little harsh, but I also had a fear that my mother, when I read her this letter, which I did, on Saturday morning or whatever it was, she was going to pick up and just go back to Philadelphia. She did not do that. We spent the rest of the weekend together. And I'd say my mother took more time to ease into it. She had a much harder time than my father, who apparently my brother had told, and he took me to dinner and just said, I love you. I just want you to be happy and be safe because it was the early 90s and it was AIDS and that was a different scary time. But to, to fast forward with my mother, my mother, I'll never forget this. Years later, I was, I had broken up with someone or something happened and I, a guy and I came home I'm living in New York by that time. And I said something, I got angry at my mother and I said, you're not supportive of me or something like that because I was talking about this guy or something. And she said to me, don't make my issues your issues. Meaning I'm of a different generation. I love you and I'm trying to support you, but I may still struggle with what gay means and having a gay son. And that really stayed with me. Like, mm -hmm. these are my issues. Don't like cop out in life and say, oh, you know, I'm supporting you. I might struggle with it quietly, but yep. that's not your business. Yep. And that was great. And then of course, you know, my mother doesn't, you know, she loves Kirk more than me and certainly her granddaughters more than, or needs to see them more than me. And, so thank God, life, we move on and you realize what's important. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to... Real estate? No, today. <laughs> and where, again, I think, you know, DC, New York, do you think any of that shaped... I left out a big piece. Okay, well, we've got time. Hold on. <laughs> what do we have? Because you say DC or New York. Right after D DC, right, you those three years, I moved overseas. Yep. And I traveled through Europe and parts of Africa and then went, ended up in Israel and started becoming more traditional and religious. Mm -hmm. And in traditional Judaism, it says homosexuality is an abomination, as is not keeping Shabbos and eating pork. And so, and they said, it's a choice. And I had dated women. I love women. So I decided I'll just make this choice and I'll just be with women. That actually didn't work. So you basically just reversed everything you just told us. Yes, exactly. Then, I went back in the Now closet. we have another story to hear. And I went, God, <laughs> was it that boring? <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> um, so I used to go to Tel Aviv. Well, that's too much information. Anyway. So you got back from Israel. Well, Israel, then South Africa, then Australia. And I was still in the closet and I would go again, play play on the sidelines. And, and then you came to back know. to New York. Moved back to New York. And it was my friend, Michelle Chant, again, from Washington. See, we we stay tight, this group of friends. And Michelle was now living in New York around the corner from me on the Upper West Side, 85th and 84th Street. And I was going out with, I was dating women, but I was also dating guys. And Michelle said to me, you got to stop this. And you got, it's not fair to you, but it's also not fair to, women that you're dating if they think you're truly interested. And so she helped me kind of like pull that together. And she was one of the friends from DC. Yeah. Got it. And not only DC, but from high school. Got it. Okay. Yeah. 
So now in 2022, Mm -hmm. um, I think let's talk about like New York and the culture and I guess why you came to New York. Like did it, did being gay or did any of that impact why you came to New York? Yeah. I said earlier that, um, Jewish New York city, it's, I wanted to go to obviously a big city. I'm moving back from Johannesburg, which I loved, but and it's a big city, but certainly not New York City. So it was either go back to Philadelphia, which felt too provincial, and I didn't want to, it felt like going home. I didn't want to do that, even though I have this mm-hmm. huge community there and my family. Go to LA. I didn't want to go to the West Coast. The whole point of moving back from overseas after six, seven years was to be close to everyone who I was missing and, mm-hmm. and including my family. New York just made sense. Yeah. It's close enough to all that. It's international. There's a huge Jewish community. It's very Jewish, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's also very gay. Mm -hmm. And so my two communities, I could mesh my two communities. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same thing. I think New York just for me Very Jewish for you? Very Jewish, yeah. (laughs) No, but I think, you know, I went to, grew up on Long Island, went to school in Boston. Right. And then New York was just always on my mind. Um, Did you ever think about anywhere else? No. Um, you, you, in my 20s, yeah. I always thought you about... You studied in Spain for a semester? I studied in Spain in college. And never... Never thought, thought about, about going that. back. Okay. I did think about or going overseas. to the West Coast in my 20s or right. something like that, but always kind of knew New York City would be home mm-hmm. for the long long term. Um, Here, I'll bring this to real Maybe estate. in hindsight, I you know wish I had done something in my 20s. So but. you moved to D.C. after... Boston College. I moved to New York. To New York. Sorry. Of yeah. course. To New York. So you moved to New York after Boston College yeah. being in Boston. And I'm tying this back to real estate. When did you buy your first apartment? Uh, t- two, when I was 26 or 27. Okay. So like yeah, pretty, that's not like four years after moving to the city. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. But I guess my question is, is real estate. You know, when we hear about people's like coming out stories and being gay, there are a lot of gay real estate agents. I mean, (laughs) I feel like it's, I feel like sometimes I go to conventions or retreats and I'm like, oh, are they going to have a gay night here? Because there's 40 gays at (laughs) this convention. It's like gay Aspen, um, gay ski week. It's true. Yeah. You know, and I think it's a very It's a very gay friendly, gay friendly industry. industry. That's because we have taste. Can you talk about times where you ran into where it wasn't so pleasant or you had to just kind of keep quiet or maybe put aside the fact that like, oh, Stephen, how's your like, how's she doing? How's your right. partner doing? Right. How's she doing? You know? And you're just like, you know what? Let me just be quiet right. for the sake of the deal. So I had a very... Because when you say you have yeah. kids yeah. and you have yes, a partner, that most people's yes, instinct, even yes. in 2022... Right is not you're with a that's guy. That's right. That's right. Unless they know. That's Unless they right. know you. Totally true. Yeah. So that's exactly what it was, actually. A very wealthy religious family. And God, I'm talking a lot about <laughs> religion these days, but um, we're in this podcast. And they actually asked, said to me, you probably don't know what Jonah is. Jonah is the orthodox conversion therapy. It's the group that's, you know, the converting, converting you from being gay to being straight, which actually I think is illegal. And so you were, you were listing their apartment or it's more than listing. I did a number. They were with the family, a very prominent client. Got it. Um, they're friends and this is going way back. And I think they're in their headspace would be different today. Yep. And they were doing this out of concern and love, but they basically said to me, and they knew my history, they knew, you know, I, who I dated, women before, and they said to me that, um, will you go try this, this Jonah, this conversion therapy in essence? And basically, it wasn't quite this. This is how I remembered. I'm sure it wasn't quite like this, but, you know, we'll help you open your own brokerage if you pursue a straight lifestyle. They certainly could have afforded to do that. And I ended up, they said, we start by just go to this therapist. So I went to this therapist. I was like, okay. And I'm in my, you know, I was in my early thirties then. So, you know, I'm I'm pretty experienced, had a very, a lovely life, probably older. I think I was living in my first apartment that I bought. 
second apartment. Anyway, so I went to this therapist and after like 15 minutes, he kind of turned to me and said, okay, so why are you here? And I said, well, I'm here because these people asked me to come thinking he was going to be this like right wing. Okay, here's how I'm going to make you straight. And he said to me, you seem pretty, you know, grounded and right. everything's going fine. Do you, do you want to keep seeing me? And I was like, no, I'm here for, because they asked me to come and that was frankly the So what was that. driving? I mean, literally, was it I think, to keep them as a client? No. Oh, that's a great question. No. No, no, no. That I think their come from was they truly were looking for what was best for me. Listen, mm-hmm. I've always known no matter what and knew eventually when I come out, I'm going to have the best gay life possible. And if I want kids, I'm going to have kids. Mm-hmm. If I want the white picket fence, I'm going to have that. I might be doing it with a man rather than a woman. Do they know you now? Oh, yeah. And this is not who they are now. Right. Again, I think all. it's I think it's all things. We're talking about a long time We're talking ago. a long time ago. Yeah, and yeah. They, they've grown and they've had their own ups and downs. Has and it ever been discussed? I think I brought it up once with them. And frankly, uh, one of the the person that was driving it is kind of out of the picture. Out of the picture. Yeah. Got it. But that's a great question. They were coming from a place of love and wanting me to have everything that I said I wanted in life. And this is the path they knew to get there. And and certainly because I had learned in yeshiva and became more traditional, it wasn't out of the blue for me. They weren't trying to convert me to Judaism. They were trying to convert me to straight to being straight. Yeah. And then where was my come from? I think that this was just not, oh my God, if I don't do this, I'm losing business. I, I never really thought I had that fear. I've been in therapy. I'm open to self-growth. I thought, okay, I'll go here and Try see it. what this person has to say. I was never going yeah. into deep conversion therapy. Yeah. But to have a 45 minute with a therapist, mm-hmm. who cares? Me talking more about myself. And I think that's the big thing is now in 2022, especially again, I'll say in New York, yep. in the lives we live, a story like that would be. As I say it, it's kind of like, whoa. Right. Yeah. And it's hard for me. I oh mean, my it's God. like, yeah. but I just don't, I mean, I'm sure it exists. I'm sure on the streets of in Manhattan, yeah. it, it exists, but we just don't hear about it as much here in 2022. Um, we don't. We, we in don't. Our circles, exactly we what don't. I keep yeah. saying. But what I will say, I think. You also we... attract, you attract what you put out. Sure. And, and I we're think at that's... a point where I don't think we would attract that kind of energy. Right. And we're in an industry again right. that yeah. is very accepting. Yeah. So I live in. In New York. I, yeah. But in New York. for now, yeah, yeah. I have a partner. We're all over social media. I have kids. Yep. I'm so much. We're really part of a community. Yeah, yeah. Upper West Side and the whole city and in charity. So there's no secret. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God it's acceptable. Well, I don't think it's necessarily about a secret. I think it's just running into people that don't necessarily know. Have you, you never had that? I feel like there was a time I was on an appointment and I think I referred, I don't know what the situation was, but I do remember just being like, just let it, let it, it's not worth going there. It wasn't worth going there. Right. But I think it's so silly. This is within real estate. In yeah. Life. So in the last five yeah. years. And so it was the, an instance where I think I might have, you know, someone might have seen my ring or something and right. they would have said, oh, like, I see. Yeah. Oh, like, hope you and your wife have fun right. wherever you were going this weekend. And I was like, you know what? Let's just keep the train moving here. Like, yeah. what am I going to do? Walk back in and, right. oh, wait, it's actually not a wife. <laughs> like, you know, but in the same sense, yeah. it's so stupid that, you know. So your first client, Sarah Crass, who we both know well, yeah. she, I remember she, uh, afterwards, you know, we were talking and she thought you were straight. Not that right. cares. Right. But she wanted to date me. What's that? Is that true? She wanted no, to she's me. married. <laughs> she wasn't married then. Yes, she was. No, she, was yes, she, she was. with Paul? She yes. was married then? Yeah. Okay. She didn't want to date you. I'm kidding. Anyway, but I was like, no, he's, <laughs> right. he's not straight. I think she asked about a girlfriend or something. Because right, right, right. you guys were getting tight and yep. seeing properties. Anyway. It's funny. Okay. Something else I have a question about. So the real estate industry is here in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess also with business and meetings and companies, do you have to ever hold back your personal views with like gay and homosexuality in terms of, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this industry is controlled by, you know, people that say might support policies that don't necessarily 
align with gay uh, gay marriage, for example. Like real estate companies are known for giving money to candidates that don't support gay marriage. Where do you stand on? Certain How do you balance companies. that? Yeah, certain it, real estate happens. companies. Yeah. Right. This is something we're going through in our personal life. Mm -hmm. We have friends. We were invited to an event in December. Mm -hmm. And we know that the host gave money mm -hmm. to a candidate that you don't voted against gay marriage. Okay. And we're not going to go. Are you? And are you? And going it's to honoring be? a very close friend of ours. Oh. And we can't go. Because I just don't understand how but we if, can. But if the. Hold on, though. If you're if you're going for your friend who's being honored, I get it. I mean, I can put it, that aside. I get that because of Don, it might make a statement. But it's not necessarily no about that. I think at right. at a certain point, we all have to say no. Okay, like you know, and I would love to honor our friend, but not at the home of someone that gave. And does your friend understand why yeah. you would say no? Totally. Interesting. Do you think you're the only one? I think other people are. I know other people are talking about it. We're the only ones that haven't, that have RSVP'd no. Got it. You know, and it's a love, it's lovely people. Yeah. We like them. But I think at a certain point with where our society is right now, and it, there's just, I can't understand why you would give money to someone, you know, you might support different reasons of theirs, but if someone is anti-gay marriage, like that's anti my life. And you're telling me, it's, it's a really challenging topic, but I think it's trying to figure out the balance. It is challenging because I don't want to get too much into this, but yeah. obviously with politics, they could be supporting this candidate for three other things that, and they weigh those and they're, they don't like that this yeah. candidate's against gay marriage, but yeah. those three other things mm -hmm. weigh he very heavy for them. And gay marriage isn't as... So let me ask their, you. Yeah. Outside of your personal life and your professional life, mm -hmm. would you be able to stomach taking a deal? Um, Kirk asked me that sometimes. If a certain person came to you. Yeah, if a certain person came to you and said, so, listen, I have yeah. this apartment. I'd love to give you the listing. Right. But you know the background. Of who they are. Of who they are and what they stand for. And it might be against your lifestyle. Could you take the deal? If it was so black and white, probably not. Yeah, I think it's. I think it comes it, back to our conversation last time. The, like, are you putting your your morality and your ethics above mm -hmm. just the cold cash, if yep. you will? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's hard. And we can transition also into like talking about your kids, but it's almost like talking out of two sides of our mouth. Mm -hmm. Like, if we are like, you know what, I got to take that big listing, right? And I'm just gonna like put my blinders right. on, be okay with it. But it's like I'm not saying it would be easy, and yeah, it, would it would really be, have to well, be, it'd be black really and hard white. to walk away from. Yes, it. and yes, but it's hard to right. stomach knowing. You know, well, we had this with uh, you know I'm on the board of a particular charity, and a, a very well known, very philanthropic family uh, potentially were making a big gift, and we had to decide whether we would accept their gift because of who they were. Who they were, yeah. And yeah, um, and we're established. And one last thing I think we should talk about is yeah. the next generation and the kids and your kids and just kids in general. Because mm -hmm. I think kids are growing up in a time where, uh, if there were kids in this room right now yeah. hearing what you just said, yeah, I mean, where I'm taken back and I'm, you know, twenty years younger than you. Imagine like a trying to explain that to a 12 year old that lives in New York, right. that goes to a school where multiple same sex family, you know, mm -hmm. some of this stuff, um, it's different. And I think, I think kids are growing up in a world today, or at least again, here in New York, where thankfully there's more of an acceptance. Um, yeah. and I see it even with my own family and my nieces and nephews. I think kids in New York are a little bit more progressive That's right. than yeah. outside of the city. Okay, um, yeah. Because I just think exposure. You know, I think our our friends who are same-sex couple, they talk about the school they go to, and there's five or six families on the Upper East Side mm -hmm. that are same-sex couples in the school. Yeah. You know, if I, were, if I were to go to other schools outside the city, I don't think the numbers are as high. So I just think awareness is what's helping the situation. It's all education and awareness is always what it's about. 
but your kids are growing up in a household with a same-sex couple. So my question is, like, how much more ahead of the game do you think they are in acceptance? And does it carry out through the rest of their life? I think, thank God for them and their friends, it is not even... It's not even discussed. It's so second nature. It's funny, yeah. Le Scarlet is four going on five. She is the first one to tell you she has two daddies and yeah. say it with such pride. Yeah. This morning she came out of the, she, you know, she came out of her bedroom and I knew she was coming out. So I was standing there and she looked up all groggy and she said, not what I was expecting. And I said, what? She said, I want the other daddy. And she kind of pushed me aside. So... I once asked Lily if she ever thought about having a mother and she right. like looked at me like I had three heads. Like, right. Why? No, I have a great life. Because it's what she knows. It's what she knows. She yep. has, thank God, a very healthy, happy yep. life with two amazing parents. So, I mean, and that's, I think, the exciting part is just how it's going to make our, hopefully make our world a better place. And these, again, like we're different generations and your stories mm -hmm. are different than mine. Their stories I, will be different than and ours. And their stories are going to be different. You know, they're behind me. Yep. And it's like, they're going to think what I'm talking about is archaic. And no offense, I think some of the things, I can't even fathom some of the stories you just told mm -hmm. because I didn't experience it. But I'm that much further behind you. Right. And I think your kids and the kids today are further behind me. In the end, it comes down to, like, really, who cares? If you're being a loving, good person and not hurting other people, totally. who cares who you love? Yeah. But again, as we say that, everybody has to keep in mind, we are blessed. Yes. And we are living in a city, with a, in a company, in an industry yes. where we're accepted. And it's not that way. And it's not that yeah. way for everyone. Yeah. And as you say, could be not states away, but miles away. Correct. Where it's very different. Yeah. Yeah. So... I think that wraps us up. Uh, wow, that was intense. Super intense. We got through it. <laughs> but uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. That was our fifth episode. We're doing these podcasts bi-monthly. Uh, I'm Tim Malone. You can ask me any questions on Instagram at Tim P. Malone NYC. And I'm Steve Cohen at Steve Cohen NY. And tune in for the next episode of Real Talk. Thanks, guys.